Before we begin, uh, let's just start with a quick prayer, okay? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God Almighty Father, we give you thanks for the gift of this evening, for the gift of our lives and the lives of these, your children, their children. We ask that you would send your spirit here among us, that we are able uh, to come to greater wisdom, understanding, knowledge of you, your ways, and your will. And we give you glory as we pray, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be, glory be to the Father, and the Spirit, amen. Okay, thank you all for being here. I very much appreciate it. A big thank you to Father Nelson and to Mrs. Steckler. Uh, this presentation this evening is a accumulation of a number of years uh, since my ordination four years ago, and working with young people. I started first uh, in high school, teaching seniors, and then for a couple of years, I worked at a middle school, the middle school in Bismarck, with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And so a big part of that, the big reason why we're here tonight is really the example and the struggles uh, of those young people and in their being, their being willing to share with me uh, those things, okay? in addition to my own struggles and the things that I've come to understand about myself as an imperfect human being, right? And of the understanding that it doesn't have to remain, we don't have to remain in kind of these modes of being that we're used to, and that there are occasionally things, right? This world's made all good, but it's a fallen world. And so even things that can be used for great good can also lead us down uh, places that are very unhealthy for us. So before we begin, two quick stories. Uh, two wonderful ladies that I had the opportunity to teach. They are both eighth grade girls. The first one uh, was trying to teach some mental prayer in our little chapel there. Uh, with one of my classes, and I wanted to see just for, you know, I'd guide them through some meditation, but something a little bit quiet. It's not so rote memorization. I just wanted to see how long, uh, I wasn't going to push it too much, you know, I wasn't going to push it over 10 minutes, but I wanted to see, can anybody kind of sit and relax for 10 minutes and then see kind of what their experience of that was? And so after that 10 minutes, uh, I just asked anybody if they're willing to share, uh, you know, what was that like? One, one girl uh, raised her hand and said, okay, yeah, well, well, how was that for you? And she said, you know, it was, it was really hard. 10 minutes of sitting still without any uh, sort of stimulation, trying to pray, very hard for her. And I asked her why, and that's what she told me. Right? She said, I think a big part of it is, is that if I'm not in class and somebody's not speaking to me and I have to be by myself, if I don't have my phone on me, I get kind of anxious. And I can't really focus. She offered that up free of charge. Another one, I've given a much smaller talk. This has ex expanded uh, greatly over the past couple of years. I'd given a much smaller talk on, on some of these things, and I had a, another wonderful lady, uh, one who you would just assume. She's always been kind of cheerful, joyful. That's like the only way that I do very cheerful, very joyful, very, you know, she wants to interact and, and, and life is good. And she told me, you know, Father, all that stuff that you just said, that's so true. Last year, when I didn't know her, last year, I really struggled and I could not pay attention at school and I felt like I was depressed all the time or angry or whatever. And then I got rid of all of my social media and it's been like way better. School is really great. And I couldn't imagine ever not even doing well from school or not being happy or being kind of just the one who always saw the positive side of it. That's how I do it. And she just confessed that my last year was not great. And so just kind of I think we all have an inclination that maybe there's something going on, right, in the culture, that there are things going on with our young people. And it's hard to deal with unless we know how to put our finger on what the real issue is, right? And so, just to begin, 
ultimately, are young people or ourselves that much different uh, from young people 20 years ago? I would say ultimately no, not really, but with one big caveat. They have a whole lot more to deal with and they have to deal with it 24 seven. If they're going to be interacting online, on social media, those types of things, which then compounds the issues that we've all struggled with when we were young. And so to not be naive in thinking uh, just by trying to tell a child, well, snap out of it, or do better, or whatever, okay? They may not be able to. And we'll get into the reason why that is here in a little bit. But please, please, please understand that our world in 2022 is not even close to the world I graduated in in 2000, let alone 1992 or before. Okay? Our young people have some real things that they're dealing with right now. And so much of it could be uh, either avoided if needed, or we could help to make them stronger and to give it to them little by little so that they're able, when appropriate, to be able to handle the great power of the technology that we have uh, sitting in our pockets, okay? So, to begin with, it's important to understand habit loops, uh, why they work and why everybody uses them. Anyone who's successful in this world in any sort of business venture, if you are good, if you're making money, you understand what a habit loop is and you absolutely use it to every benefit that you can. Okay? I first learned about these uh, my, one of my last years in the seminary. Uh, I was wanting to study virtue. And we had a class called Habits of Holiness. And uh, a lot of these classes were meant to help us you know, kind of write a thesis paper and that sort of thing. And I was introduced to a book uh, written by Charles Duhigg. Uh, and in this, it's basically all about habit loops and how it's used in business, more or less. But it would be the same thing for any of uh, the regular activities that we would perform in a day. Almost everything you do, unless you're consciously trying to override it, will fall into this in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's from waking up in the morning, which is a good habit, right? Uh, or to endlessly scrolling on TikTok, which is perhaps not the best thing, right, for us. So, how do habit loops work? You have a cue, you have a routine, and you have a reward. So, first up, you have a cue. Uh, Sunday morning after Mass, beginning of January, I'm ready to relax. And I know it's going to be a rough ride watching the Vikings lose another playoff, right? This is a cue for me to call up Pizza Hut and order a pepperoni and black olive deep dish pizza. Okay? That's what I do. Okay? It's comforting. I like the way it tastes. Right? And so I go through the whole routine of ordering it, hopefully having it delivered, which is kind of exciting, gets me going. I get everything set up, so hopefully I don't have to get up from the couch for the whole game. I can just eat pizza and eat, drink whatever. Okay? So I have my routine. In the middle of that routine, or at the end of that routine, I receive a reward. Typically, uh, a bunch of nice shots of dopamine. Okay? Feels good. Right? And I can sit in that for as long as it happens. Right? Uh, but eventually, what's going to happen is that that dopamine is going to run out, and I'm going to want to cue for some more of that, some way, shape, or form. Okay? Some way, shape, or form. And so, if you know what you're doing, if you're one of these companies, you want to tap into that. Okay, so how does that look for, say, Instagram? Right? Well, if somebody I'm waiting for, uh, maybe can't wait to keep looking, what I have to look forward to each day is see if anybody liked my uh, what, Instagram story, right? Uh, see how many likes I can get on Twitter. Right? Every one of those, one, it gets me out of my normal day, where maybe I'm not feeling so great. See if anybody 
likes me, somebody likes what I say, gives me that little shot of dopamine, right? I get that routine, and then that sets me good for a little while, right? Okay, these guys know that. They're not dumb. One of the things, the biggest struggles, I think, that I try to get across to people in general is, I agree, these all can be great tools, right? These can all be great tools, in some way, shape, or form. If you look at Facebook, how is it sold to you? And yes, it is sold. You may not have to pay for it. It is absolutely sold. Why? Make money. There's a reason why Zuckerberg is worth multi-billions of dollars, right? It's not because he's giving people stuff for free. I can guarantee you that. And trust me, all of this, like none of this has anything to do, I do not care if Zuckerberg makes a trillion dollars. He'd be a fool if he owns this business to not try to make a trillion dollars. But just to be real with ourselves that when he says, very important that you're using Meta, or Facebook, or Instagram, so that you can stay, that's the reason why it's so important, so you can stay in contact with your grandkids, or with your grandma. Do you think Zuckerberg cares at all about your grandma, or about your grandkids? I'm not saying you can't use it for that, but let's not delude ourselves into thinking that that's the ultimate motive, and that they're not trying to get us or whoever, because it doesn't make any sense to not. If you own a restaurant and you're not trying to get people addicted to your food, that is foolish. You're not gonna make money, right? So I don't care, that's fine. But let's just be honest about it, okay? It's meant to be used and it's meant to be overused, right? So, just initial to kind of lay that foundation. So, just the, the most general understanding before we start to dive into things. As we just talked about, when we enter into these habit loops over and over and over again, whether it's a video game or whether we're searching something online or even if it's just some food that I'm eating, what happens? If it becomes an addiction, it could be to alcohol, to drugs, what happens is, is the more you do it, the reason why it's hard to quit is because my brain actually is restructured to work in that particular way and I cannot be happy unless that circuit is being fulfilled. So your brain physically, okay, I mean, this is not like, oh, my brain kind of works so I'm like a left-handed or left brain type person or right. It, the physical characteristics, okay, the material, okay. Right? So, here's the deal with that. There's what uh, Aviv Weinstein, Dr. Aviv Weinstein, he is out of Israel, uh, works out of the university there, and he's trying to do a whole lot of all sorts of different types of, of research around a lot of these things. And so he's coming up with some different words to help to explain what's happening, but uh, one of them are what he calls switch costs. So each time we pause to answer a new notification or get an alert, we're being interrupted. And with that interruption, we pay a price, something researchers call a switch cost. Now, in addition to what's happening in our brain, also just you know, on the surface level of things, they're estimating that if you're sitting at work or trying to do whatever with your family or you, know, you name it, those switch costs are reducing probably the amount of time on average that you would be spending doing what you meant to be doing originally, it reduces that by about 40%, okay? But we don't notice that because we don't really notice time when we're entering into these things. So every time we switch tasks, we're shooting ourselves up with a dose of stress hormone, cortisol, right? Whenever we're trying to take on a new task, there's gonna be a little bit of that. The switching, though, puts our thoughtful reasoning, the prefrontal cortex of our brain to sleep, picks up dopamine, okay? Which is what makes us and draws us to pursuing what we would consider good. So reward and motivation, things that we consider good. Whether they actually are good or not, it's what our brain considers to be good. 
and causes us to crave even more interruptions, spiking the dopamine, which perpetuates the cycle. Okay. We're all fairly clear on just the basic mode that's going through. So just to uh, piggyback on top of um, our initial conversation about what the owners of these companies know and how they're using that, uh, if you had to guess, what is the legal age for internet adulthood? Okay, now this was uh, kind of sort of fought over in Congress for a while. Unfortunately, many years ago, like in 1998, I think, um, to my knowledge, at least up to through 2021, this had not been changed. Uh, and all of the companies, whenever it is brought up, typically what you're going to find is the tech companies and uh, kind of their lobbyists are always you know, going to lobby and keep it the same. Uh, if I were to ask you, what is the age of internet and adulthood, what would you guys say? What's that? 13. 13 is the age of internet and adulthood, right? So, <laughs> how exactly that works. I do not know why that would be allowed, okay? But that does open up all sorts of things to uh, different uh, children. And ultimately, um, it would be hard for a parent to come back on a company for this. It's what's written in the law, okay? So uh, just to, as another point to show, trust me, right? We're saying we want TikTok to be able to quick educational videos or, you know, all of these things that they can be used for. Can they be used as a tool? Sure. Are they typically used only as a tool? Are they designed to only be a tool? No. No. So these guys know this, and they know it very, very well. Steve Jobs in 2010 was on the stage at the Apple event releasing the iPad, and he described it as a wonderful device that brought you educational tools that allowed you to surf the web, it allowed you to watch videos, it allowed you to interact with other people, and he basically said it's the best way to do all those things. I would not disagree. iPads are awesome. I mean, there's more tech in that thing than probably all of the tech that it took to launch the first mission to the moon, right, which took up rooms, okay? I'm not going to disagree with that. I think he's wow. iPad's done. Steve Jobs was quite amazing at what he did. So later in the year, Jobs was asked, your kids must love the iPad. He answered, they haven't used it. We limit how much technology our kids use at home. Okay? Walter Anderson, author of Steve Jobs. Every evening, Steve made a point of having dinner at the big long table in their kitchen discussing books and history and a variety of things. No one ever pulled out an iPad or computer. The kids did not seem addicted at all to devices. That just simply was not allowed. Family time is family time. I give Steve Jobs credit because as opposed to, so I finally got off the, the Apple train. I kind of just wanted to see what else is out there. So I went to some Samsung stuff. One thing I'll give Steve Jobs, and he did fight for this, to be honest. Uh, the ability uh, to lock down an iPhone in a much greater way and more completely, um, it, it's just exponential over something like a Samsung. So uh, we'll, get, we'll get into it over time, but if it's an absolute must, say for like an older teenager or something, to have a smartphone for some reason, uh, iPhones probably actually are the way to go if you want to be able to control it, just to, just to be honest. Chris Anderson, former editor of Wired, big, huge tech uh, magazine company, chief ex uh, executive of 3D Robotics and a drone maker. This guy makes his life off of tech has instituted time limits and parental controls on every device in his home. Children ages 6 through 17. My kids accuse me and my wife of being fascist and overly concerned about tech, and they say that none of their friends have the same rules. That's because we have seen the dangers of technology firsthand. I've seen it in myself. I don't want to see that happen to my kids. Evan Spiegel, Snapchat CEO, he and his wife impose a one and a half hour of screen time per week for their kids 
That is not a token. That is not per day, or per morning, or per evening, or per weekend. It's one and a half hours of screen time per week. The guy that runs Snapchat. I have rarely, if you lead a, a, a young person to their own devices and put them on either Snapchat or especially TikTok, like never less than an hour and a half at one sitting. Evan Williams, founder of Blogger, uh, co-founder of Twitter and of Medium. His boys have hundreds of actual books to read instead of iPads. Why does he do that? When you read a book, okay, when you read a book, you generate the images described in the book with your mind. That involves making connections between different parts of your brain. Deeper learning of more conceptual information has been shown in several studies to help prevent shrinkage in the brain and reduce risk of dementia. So instead of just always having the images there, you're having to use more parts of your brain, which integrates all of those parts and keeps the rest of them strong, and you don't start to rely solely on one or two aspects of what you're capable of. And when we rely solely on one or two aspects of what our brain is capable of doing, our brain shrinks, and we slowly become something uh, less than what God has created us to be. Okay. Leslie Gold, founder and chief executive of Sutherland Gold Group, tech media relations and analytics company. So it's her job to make sure that this tech company looks good. It's her job to defend uh, the things that this particular uh, company does for tech. He says, we have a strict no screen time during the week rule for our kids, but you have to make allowances as they get older and need the computer for school. Nothing during the week, a little bit for school, and maybe some of them. If you look at these people and many other like them who are uh, living in and around typically Silicon Valley, right, which we're all more than familiar with, yes. If there was a place in the world where a school or schools could be set up with the very best technology, and there are people who can make that happen, and cost is not an issue, and it would be the best, the very best, for their kids, I cannot think of another place in the world where that could happen better than in Silicon Valley, right? Many Silicon Valley specialty schools are very low tech, some using only chalkboards and pencils to write things. Okay. They don't allow their kids <laughs> to have unlimited access to the stuff that they are making and that they are selling. There is no way that they're going to let their kids uh, use it to that extent. It's not good enough for their kids. It is good enough for your kids. Okay? This is the reality of the situation. The one rule all tech parents have that were interviewed in the words of Chris Anderson, rule number one, there are no screens in the bedroom, period, ever. The biggest changes that I've ever seen in students uh, across, if, if there's a student that's really struggling, my first question, especially if they, they can't stay away for whatever at school, or even if they're super depressed, whatever, my first question every single time is, are you allowed to have your phone or an iPad or computer in your room? Every time. Almost always, the answer is yes. We're willing. Would encourage you to ask your parents to help you to take that out of your life. Do that. What happens? Child is way happy, way more, way more. Every time. So the question is, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way. Remember when we were talking earlier? Uh, about these, a lot of these uh, social medias uh, being free, 
basically you just have to sign up for them. Right? If you're not paying for a service, okay, you are the service. Right? If you're not paying for it, trust me. There is something that's being used there, and it's not the thing that you're using for. Right? How many times? So just to compare and to say that a phone is simply a tool, which it can be used as a tool. Please, please hear me out. I'm, I'm, I have a smartphone, okay? I still use one, okay? I struggle, okay? Right? But one thing that I don't do is I, I don't pretend like my phone is a tool in the same way that a hammer is. Have you ever been anxious on a road trip because you didn't carry your hammer with you? Right? Or sometimes I just can't help myself. I need to pound some nails right now. Right? Okay? It's not the same thing. Just not the same thing. In the UK, which I would, and I assume you would as well, very similar culture, UK teens percent depressed as a function of hours per weekday on social media. I believe this is around 2015, so I feel very confident saying that these numbers are probably higher. If you look at girls uh, from none to a half hour, right, a little bit, but as you get up to five hours per day, um, it's up there. You're almost 40%. Boys actually do go down for a little bit and then go up. Uh, in general, the boys don't suffer or struggle as much with an overuse of social media, or at least it doesn't affect them in the same way as it does the ladies. However, the boys are affected more by other types of, of tech, which we'll get into. Hospital admissions for non-fatal self-harm in girls, okay? As you can see, from about 2009 to 2015, and this is for sure up, I've seen more recent data from 2020 or 2021, uh, this is for sure gone up even more. Now, if you look at the graph, two things right away. Starts and looks like at about 2009 going up. Now, can I say that there is a direct causation between uh, social media and all of the tech, uh, and what's happening to the ladies? No. Can I say there's a pretty strong relationship, though? I absolutely can. There's around 2008, between 2008 and 2009, that's when Facebook first came out, and when smartphones started taking off and things shortly thereafter. Okay? And almost all of the data follows that same exact um, time frame. Okay? Now, you may be saying, well, you know, from 15 to 19, at the worst, what are we talking about? 630, 625 uh, girls out of 100,000. Not too bad. Okay, read the title again. That's just for hospital admissions for non-fatal self-harm. That's not for fatal self-harm. It's not included in that. That is not for the self-harm that doesn't go to the hospital. That is not for the girls who are on anti-depression or anti-anxiety meds or for those who aren't on any of that stuff and are still struggling. That is just for non-fatal self-harm going to the hospital. That's a lot. And I assure you, a whole lot more to start adding in all of the other groups. Okay? The thing that's really sad, if you look at the girls aged 10 to 14 from almost, you know, 100, up to, I mean, that is just 189% increase in that short period of time. And we don't really know what this means for somebody who uh, you know, was born maybe shortly thereafter, right, and has lived in this their whole life. And it's probably not only due simply to relationships online. That's where our mind immediately goes to, and rightfully so. I'm not saying that a lot of that isn't the cause of that. But there are other things happening in the brain that make it much harder to overcome a negative relationship on a device, okay, which we're going to get into. So what to do? Jonathan Haidt, uh, he's been studying a lot of this uh, recently, it says right now families are trapped. I've heard many parents say that they don't know, don't want their children on Instagram, but they allow them to lie about their age and open accounts because, well, that's what everyone else has done. Dismantling such traps takes coordinated action. The principals of local elementary and middle schools are well placed to initiate that coordination. 
why I'm so thankful to Father Nelson and Mrs. Stecker to allow me to do this tonight. We can initiate the action, but for it to carry on and for it to have any legs, my hope, right, is that we could band together and, and, and really work towards eliminating a lot of the things that our students, I think, are unnecessarily plagued with. I'll give you all the time in the world you tell me what you need, but ultimately, right, this has, has to be a group. Right? So but getting into some of the, what the boys struggle with. So this is an image, a CAD scan of a ventral striatum. The top one is from healthy volunteers. The bottom one is from compulsive pornography users. All right, so it's lighting up. Well, that doesn't tell me a lot. I don't even know what a ventral striatum does or is, right? Ventral striatum, subcortical brain region innervated with dopaminergic neurons. Okay, so helping to deliver that dopamine that we talked about, the thing that makes us feel good. Involved in tracking the subjective value of stimuli, things that make us want to do things. Signaling the presence of expectation, uh, presence of an expectation of reward and encoding errors and outcomes of such predictions. Is it worth my time? When what I am typically looking at is much more exciting than listening to Mrs. Smith talk to me about the square root of whatever number. Right? I don't even come close. Now, have students always struggled with that? Sure. Do you think they struggle with it a bit more now? Probably. Right? Probably. How much more? <laughs> Going to be really interesting. So, effect on working memory. Same thing, we're still dealing with pornography here. Working memory is the ability to keep information in mind while using it to complete a task or deal with a challenge. So, just simply, how well can I remember something as I'm trying to work through? So, if I'm reading a story, can I remember the character, uh, the name, who they are, maybe some of the characteristics at the beginning of a page? as well as I can uh, at the end of two pages later. For example, it's a capacity to juggle various bits of information as you do a math problem and keep characters straight as you might read a story. It helps you hold your goal in mind, resist distractions, and inhibit impulsive choices. So it's critical to learning and planning. This is some more recent research you look at the graphs, the one on the left is a graph that is tracking working memory capacity. The other one is just simple fluid intelligence. Now, if we look at working memory capacity, what this is, is where is the person's phone? Now remember, these are not teenagers, these are college students. Their brains are more developed, right? Hopefully have a little bit more self-control. And even within that, if the phone location between it being on a desk in a pocket or in a bag or in a, a, another room, it changes their scores by over two points. And not a single person from either the desk or the pocket bag got as high as the, as the lowest score uh, of the phone being in the other room. So you think, oh, it's only a little over two points. No, it's consistently for everyone, no matter their intelligence, different. For sure. And that's this is with college students. It's not with high school or middle students. I assure you, this grows the younger you. Right? Effect on decision making. A study found that viewing pornographic imagery interfered, interfered with decision making during a standardized uh, cognitive test. It suggests porn might affect executive functioning, which is a set of mental skills that help you get things done. So, thinking, okay, pornography. It's not as uh, big of an issue as TikTok or uh, Instagram or whatever, okay, Snapchat. Or at least it's something that I have to wait for. I, you know, I can wait for it a little bit later on, right? We can deal with that when that time comes. What is the average age of first exposure to pornography? Huh? Got it? That's pretty close. I'm assuming you have an idea already. 8 to 11 years old, 3rd to 6th grade. 
If your student hasn't seen pornography by the time they're a senior, I would be dropped dead surprised. I would be venture to guess. I don't know. Fathers, you could probably help me out. The number of students, just in general, boys and girls, who maybe it's a regular thing, I would say it's probably over 50%. For sure, the guys. It, it, it's it's out there, and they're struggling, and it's taking away their capacity to learn, and it's taking away their capacity to be able to interact with the environment around them, and to have meaningful relationships with the people around them. Okay, very important. Going on just to just regular internet use. So this is a finished study, um, just in general. This is how it was set up. You are we're trying to study the relationship between internet use, school engagement, burnout, and depressive symptoms. What they came up with is that uh, they absolutely found these reciprocal paths between burnout and depressive symptoms, but ultimately saying that the results show that among adolescents, excessive internet use can be a cause of school burnout that can later spill over to depressive symptoms. Okay, so girls typically seem like as normal uh, suffer more from the depressive symptoms and school burnout, and the boys typically suffer more from excessive internet use, which, again, it's saying it seems like the boys are getting out easy, not so fast. Okay. It may not be so much depressive symptoms, but what they're going to struggle with is something potentially uh, over time, maybe. Okay, It's not 100% in every case. I'm just saying that so far, what they're finding is, is uh, a little bit more scary even than depression. So what about video games? Montreal study. Typically, uh, when people talk about video games, most of the kind of pushback that I've seen is that video games are violent or they will uh, somehow um, initiate or to increase the risk of violence done you know, by uh, a student uh, against somebody else or in schools or whatever. Okay? The studies do not bear that out. Okay? It's the wrong argument. Okay? Video games are dangerous for a different reason. Um, you can try to argue against it, but the, the, the pure fact of the matter is that that's not the case. Okay. However, uh, what does happen after playing 90 hours, which is almost nothing, okay? 90 hours, you have barely broken a game. Okay. You're probably not even really that great at it yet. Uh, you are talking, especially as somebody who's a gamer, I mean, you're talking way into the hundreds of hours, right? And if it's a like a massive multiplayer online game, it's not unusual for you know guys or gals to spend you know close to a thousand hours on this thing, okay? Brain scans and response on her show what Gregory West said is statistically significant gray matter loss in the hippocampus. Okay, again, what does that mean? Okay, what does that mean? Another another side effect before I go to the next slide. One thing that you may notice, and I, I have noticed it in, in some students, and they're not trying to do it, but in games, if they play a lot of games like uh, Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto, it's not so much the violence that they turn to, but there's a lot more lying they've noticed. They have a, a bigger, uh, harder time with lying. But first, they relied more heavily on the brain structure called the caudate nucleus, okay, to find their way in a game. You want to be quick, right? You don't have time to kind of think through every scenario. So what you need to do if you're playing something like Call of Duty, you have to make quick decisions, okay? So that means your brain relies on this caudate nucleus. So it helps process visual information and controls movement. Involved in the working memory again, cognitive function and emotions. Structure plays a vital role in how the brain learns, specifically the storing and processing of memories. So as a feedback, feedback processor, it uses information from past experiences to influence future actions and decisions. Here's the thing with that. Does your brain know the difference between a video game and real life when you're trying to make decisions? It does not, okay? So if I'm always looking for the quickest way to do something, or I'm looking for the quickest way to resolve the situation in a video game, I'm going to do the same thing in life. Because it's the way my brain works. 
If what gets me going in a video game so that I can save the world is to get angry, right, and to get uh, all super amped up and, and, to, and to go faster and move quicker, and I'm presented with the same type of a difficult situation but in real life, what am I going to do? I'm going to get angry and I'm going to get frustrated. And what I'm going to realize is I'm not as good at navigating real life situations as I am navigating through Nazis at World War II. And that makes me mad and frustrated and I don't want to participate. Important for the development also in use of language. Experts think that communication skills are controlled mostly by the Caudate nucleus and the thalamus. This is going to be individual to every student, of course, depends on how much they're playing, but these are some of the potential things that uh, can be messed around with. Video games continue. All people who we call response learner and experience a reduction in gray matter within the hippocampus, which we had talked about. Long story short, the hippocampus is a well understood biomarker for certain neuropsychiatric diseases. Okay? When you don't use the hippocampus, you lose it because you're relying on something else within the brain structure and you're not exercising all of the parts of the brain. What does that mean? People with reduced gray matter in the hippocampus are more at risk for developing post-traumatic stress disorder and depression when they're younger and Alzheimer's disease when they're older. Okay, this is why doctors, uh, those of us who perhaps have been around a little bit longer, puzzles, books, okay, keep exercising all of the parts of the brain. Don't just sit down and watch TV. That's death for the brain. In general, with uh, all of the different types of media, it can play with the cortical th thickness of our brains, okay, so just the very outside kind of part of the brain. Most studies indicate that general intelligence, attention, planning, organization is positively associated with the thickness of the cortical region, okay? So you want as thick a, a part of that as you can possibly have. By age 40, it naturally decreases by about 5% every decade. So, in adulthood, it's been found that higher intellectual ability is associated with more thickening. Okay? Here's the problem. In young people, we're finding what is found old brain syndrome. So, study 4,277 adolescents. Is this the biggest study ever? No. But it's fairly sizable. Using the adolescent brain cognitive development scale and functional magnetic renaissance imaging, investigators discovered a significant negative correlation between screen media activity and cortical thickness. These findings suggest that the excessive use of screen media causes the brain to age prematurely. Okay. So that 5% at 40 is going to be much more exaggerated. By the time we don't know what that looks like. There's nobody who's been born and has lived through all stages of this that is now 40 years old. We don't even know what that looks like. Right? Even from a very young age, in a recent study, it was indicated in five year old children that an increase in digital media use is associated with a decrease in the microstructural integrity of white matter tracts that are associated with the development of language and literacy. I'm basically just breaking my way into education. Like people who are teachers, you know, I know that there are all sorts of reasons right now why across America uh, goes beyond just this, uh, why reading levels uh, have really sunk and comprehension levels have really sunk. I, I get that there are other factors at play, but please don't tell me this isn't one of them. Right? Uh, our kids' brains are shrinking because they're not using them. Right? They're, it, we're, we're just taking in stimuli that feels good. So, how do we keep thick? One of the, this is one of my favorite things. Uh, all of the multitude of studies conducted since 2005, huge positive impact in meditation and prayer. You want to keep your brain thick, you want to keep it working, turn everything off, put it away, 
Spend some time in meditation and prayer. Be intentional in the things you choose to do. Keep learning from other things, from things other than screens. Get your exercise. Eat healthy fats and foods. The same thing, you know, our parents and grandparents have always been telling us. Exactly, get out and play. Is the very best thing for kids. So conclusions, just in general. Moderation is very important. This is the two to three hours at max. That's for all of screen time, okay? Now, if you listen to, like, a Dr. Leonard Sachs or if you listen to Jonathan Haidt, in general, not saying it's the same for everyone, but in general, there's, they would not, or they would recommend very strongly against any child under 16 having a smartphone. And then once you get to the point of having a smartphone, don't just unlock all of the features right away, right? So I think as much harm can come eventually by keeping them away from everything, right? So that they don't know how to interact with it. But to be smart about the way we introduce them to these things, right? So that um, when it comes time for them to be, because we care about our kids much longer than just until they turn 18, right? right? We want to set them up for success down the road. But in general, like if, if, if it's just an absolute necessity, which I can't think of a reason why it would be an absolute necessity, but maybe it is. For uh, a young person uh, under 16 to have to be on something like Snapchat or TikTok, an accumulation of all of that, it's especially for girls based on the data, less than a half hour a day. Right? Less than a half hour. What they're giving you here, this is just simply to avoid the brain becoming something less than the brain. Right? This, this is not having to do with depression. This is not having to do with anxiety. This is just simply not uh, turning your brain into something that it was never turned into. Importance of prayer and meditation. Practice intentionality to keep uh, attentional capacity strong. It means just turning things off, focus on something else. Tech-free zones, periods, you gotta break that dopamine cycle. Avoid the urge to use the phone as a pacifier. I know this is super hard. Even as a teacher, it's super hard to not do this. Trust me, there have been days. It's to be this time of year. We're almost to summertime. I'm kind of tired. YouTube looks really good right now. And there's this video I haven't shown. Right? Totally, totally get it. Don't only get information from your phone and good sleep hygiene. That is the biggest, one of the biggest things. But people ask a lot, why do we talk about virtue all the time here? We talk about virtue all of the time here because virtue is a good habit. And everything that you do is based in some way, shape, or form on habit, whether for good or for ill. And so virtue ultimately elevates the intellect and will, and it will always improve your life, always. Bad habits, vices, they are vicious. We call them that for a reason. They are not good for you. When we're talking about the seven deadly sins, okay, things like lust, or greed, or anger, they kill for real. Okay? Have you ever asked yourself, or have you ever had a week where you just can't help uh, but to pay attention to the news, and the news is always bad, and uh, especially if I happen to run into somebody that I wouldn't agree with online, and they say something that's really stupid and it's completely agitating, and then the second that I get to work, I'm just kind of PO'd all day long and I don't really want to talk to anybody. But it feels kind of good too, doesn't it? Be mad and make sure people, you let people know you're mad. Hey, I've done it. It does feel good. But what does it do ultimately? Rips you apart. Rips everybody around you apart. Right? It kills, man. It plays on emotion and feelings. The longer that we are willing to sit in that the simple habit loop of dopamine and serotonin, okay, who else functions in that way? Like it is created to function. 
Humans? Animals? We turn ourselves, if we're wanting to continue to play off of dopamine and serotonin for the rest of our lives, it takes away our intellect and makes us something less than what God has created us. Turns us into a dog. Never meant to be. Okay. This is just scratching the surface. I am not a doctor. I did not study this stuff in any way, shape, or form, okay? Outside of just my own interest in reading other people's stuff. I'm only doing this because I've seen uh, the destruction that it's had on a number of kids that I come to care about very deeply, and I don't want it to happen to more kids. I've seen the type of things that it can do in my own life. And my friends know. I don't want that to happen to anyone. Okay? So do I know everything? I know nothing. That's, this is just scratching the surface. I'm just pointing out, picking out a few different things that I've found uh, that are good. So you have Dr. Leonard Sachs. He's got a ton of books. I encourage you to read them. Dr. Aviv Weinstein, if you want to find some clinical research online that you don't have to pay for and you can kind of let, like, if you like to read clinical studies and stuff, he has some of that on there. Uh, you can read those things like when we were talking about the phone, whether it's in the bag or in your pocket, right? He's the one who helps with some of those things. Uh, the Coddling of the American Mind uh, by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt. Uh, Irreversible Damage by Abigail Schreier. I'm not saying that these, uh, everything in any of these you're going to agree with or that they're all, like every single thing is capital. Okay? But they do speak truth. And that's what we need right now. Okay? Where I got most of the porn statistics and the statistics there at the end about the way in which the different parts of the brain work, I got that from yourbrainonporn.com. Gregory West, who uh, I believe has died now, he's an atheist, and he's bringing this all strictly from uh, his science uh, point of view. And he has had a huge impact in the way in which we come to understand what technology does to the brain. So you go on there, trust me, there's gonna be a lot of stuff you might not like. Please do not let that deter you from looking at true studies and true statistics. The guy knows his stuff and he's not afraid to say it, trust me. The vast majority of it, you're gonna be like, oh, that. Okay. So, uh, He's very good. Like I said, Charles Duhigg, last name D-U-H-I-G-G, -G, if you want to learn more about habit loops or just kind of see how companies use that uh, to their advantage. Um, they do that very well. So 